All right, let's get right into it. Your assigned problems may or may not have different randomized values. For best results, attempt the assignment on your own before watching these solutions. Students are encouraged to frequently pause the video to work out steps on their own before proceeding with the solutions. And here is the list of topics to be covered in this video. First up, let's prove the identity sine squared t over cos t equals secant t minus cos t. We're going to start with the left-hand side and manipulate it to look like the right-hand side. You could definitely go the other way. I just happen to see a nice first step we can try, a Pythagorean identity seeing that there's a sine squared of t. Observe, there's going to be many, many possible correct proofs. I'm just giving one here. If you did it differently and you think you're correct, by all means, ask your instructor to evaluate your own proof. So we have sine squared t over cos t, the original left-hand side. I'm going to replace sine squared t with 1 minus cosine squared t. Now we can split this into two fractions to get 1 over cosine t minus cosine squared t over cosine t. The first term by definition is secant of t, and in the second term we can cancel a shared factor. So we get secant t minus cosine t, which was the right-hand side we desired. So starting with the left-hand side, doing one step at a time, always fully justified, we manage to see that it is exactly equal to the right-hand side. So those two things are always equal. In problem two, let's establish the identity negative tangent of t minus cosine of t over sine t minus one is equal to the secant of t. And again, we're gonna start with the left and manipulate it to look like the right side. You can go the other way, but in this problem, I really wouldn't recommend it. I recommend generally find what is more complicated looking and then make it look simple rather than the other way around. If you have a complicated expression, there are generally a relatively few ways to simplify it. But if you have something simple, there are innumerable ways you could arbitrarily make it look more complicated. And it's usually easier to find a correct step to take next if you have fewer things to choose from. So the first thing I'm gonna to do to this left-hand side is express everything just in terms of sines and cosines. So there are fewer different types of objects to worry about. And there's really just the one tangent. So I replace the tangent with sine over cosine. So our left-hand side is definitely equal to negative sine t over cos t minus cos t over sine t minus one. Those two terms can be given a common denominator. The first term has to be multiplied by sine t minus one over sine t minus one. The second term has to be multiplied by cos t over cos t. We can factor a negative one out of this whole expression. Then we can combine them into one fraction because they have the same denominator. So we have negative sine squared t minus sine t plus cos squared t over cos t times sine t minus one. And in the numerator, observe, we have a sine squared t plus cos squared t, which we can replace with a one. That's our standard Pythagorean identity. So, so far what we have is that the negative tangent of t minus cos t over sine t minus one is definitely equal to negative one minus sine t over cos t times sine t minus one. We're trying to eventually manipulate this to just look like the secant of t. Now that negative can be redistributed back into the numerator to give us sine t minus one over cos t times sine t minus one. Now we have a shared factor of sine t minus one. We can cancel it out. We just have one over cosine t, which by definition is exactly the secant of t. So starting from the left, doing one justified thing at a time, we showed that it is always equal to the expression on the right. In problem three, we'll prove the identity that the secant of t plus the tangent of t all squared is always equal to one plus sine t over one minus sine t. We're still gonna start with the left and make it look like the right-hand side. I think the left does seem a bit more complicated because it has secants and tangents and squaring, even though the right side does have a fraction. So we'll take that left-hand side and we'll rewrite it in terms of sines and cosines. So the left-hand side we started with, secant t plus tangent t all squared is always equal to one over cos t plus sine t over cos t all squared. They already have a common denominator, so we can just combine them. That's one plus sine t all over cosine t, and then that entire expression is squared. So let's go ahead and square things out. Our numerator squares to sine squared t plus two sine t plus one. Our denominator squares to cos squared t. We have a few different options at this step. What I choose to do next is use a Pythagorean identity specifically in the denominator, replacing cos squared t with one minus sine squared t. Now, the reason I chose to do this is because one minus sine squared t is a difference of two squares. So it can be factored as one minus sine t times one plus sine t. 
looking at where we're trying to go, what we want this to be equal to, we want the denominator to be 1 minus sine t. And factoring this difference of squares has produced a factor of 1 minus sine t. But it has this unwanted factor of 1 plus sine t, so how are we going to account for that? So we need to cancel out this unwanted factor of 1 plus sine t from the denominator. Now the only way we can cancel something out of the denominator is if it can also be factored out of the numerator. So we have to factor the numerator, but we already know how to do it. It came from the expression 1 plus sine t squared. So this is all equal to 1 plus sine t squared over 1 minus sine t times 1 plus sine t. And now we can cancel a shared factor of 1 plus sine t, and we have arrived at our destination 1 plus sine t over 1 minus sine t. Now observe, we had the, the numerator 1 plus sine t squared, we distributed it, and then later we refactored it. So you could clean up your proof by going back and not bothering to distribute that numerator. There's no point in distributing out the numerator if later you're going to refactor it. However, when we did distribute that square in the numerator, we also did it in the denominator, and that was important. So the cleaned up proof might be nicer to read, it skips an unnecessary step, but a reader could also be confused, why did we square the denominator and not the numerator? Both versions, by the way, are totally correct. It is not incorrect to have unnecessary steps in a proof as long as they're not incorrect. So in general, when you prove something in mathematics, it's very rare for the first way you figure it out to be the final version. There are, are typically going to be small things you did that weren't quite necessary, and you can clean up your proof by removing them later if you think it is helpful to do so. In problem four, let's prove the identity. Cotan x plus tan x all divided by cosecant x is equal to secant x. So let's take the left, we're gonna make it look like the right, but we're gonna rewrite in terms of sines and cosines. So our original left-hand expression is always equal to cos x over sine x plus sine x over cos x, all over one over sine x. First, let's look at our overall numerator and give it a common denominator. So cos squared x over sine x cos x plus sine squared x over sine x times cos x, all divided by one over sine x. That first term of cos x over sine x, we multiplied by cos x over cos x. So we got cos squared x over sine x cos x. And the second term sine x over cos x, we multiplied by sine x over sine x, giving us sine squared x over sine x cos x. So in the numerator, those two terms have the same denominator. We can combine them and observe that this numerator of the numerator is now cos squared x plus sine squared x, so we can apply a Pythagorean identity. So our original left-hand side is definitely equal to one over sine x cos x all over one over sine x. We can cancel a shared factor of 1 over sine x. We can factor 1 over sine x out of the numerator, and we can factor 1 over sine x out of the denominator, leaving behind just 1 over cos x all over 1, and otherwise known as secant of x. So the left-hand side is definitely equal to the right. Lastly, let's prove the identity. Secant x over tan x plus cotan x is always equal to the sine of x. So let's take the left-hand side and rewrite in terms of sines and cosines. So what we started with, secant x over tan x plus cotan x, is always equal to 1 over cosine x all over sine x over cos x plus cos x over sine x. The two terms in the denominator can be given a common denominator themselves. So the common denominator would be sine x times cos x. So that first term has to get multiplied by sine x over sine x, and the second term has to be multiplied by cos x over cos x. The two terms that we generated in the denominator now have a common denominator themselves. They can be combined. Observe the appearance of a sine squared x plus cos squared x, allowing us to apply a Pythagorean identity. So overall, what we started with on the left is always equal to 1 over cos x over 1 over sine x cos x. We can do this division by a fraction by multiplying by the reciprocal instead. So 1 over cos x times sine x cos x over 1. We can cancel the shared factor of cos x, leaving behind just sine x.